Hello, friends. Welcome to this special short edition of Calibrate Conversations. Today, I want to take a moment and bring to your attention something that I just discovered, and it's kind of crazy I just discovered it because it turns out that it's over 10 years old, but that's what TikTok does. Something goes viral, and all of a sudden, something that you didn't even know existed um, is all over your screens. So today, we are going to talk about the Queen James Bible. It's a very big day Bible. And so I just got this off Amazon for $28. And I really did not want to give them my money, but I uh, decided I needed to get a copy just to see what it was all about and report back to you my analysis of what is going on here with the Queen James Bible. So the Queen James Bible came out about 10 years ago. And it's interesting that it's Obviously, people would uh, ask, why is it called the Queen James Bible? It's actually the King James version of the Bible that they've changed the language of the homosexual passages. And so the entire rest of the text is in the King James version. It's actually uh, not the original King James version, ironically. Um, it is the, I think, 17, uh, the 1769 translation of the King James Bible. And so uh, here's um, why, why they said that they uh, chose to use the King James translation. So this is their words, not my words. And then we'll dig into the some info about the King James translation. So the obvious gay link to King James, known amongst friends and couriers, is Queen James because of his many gay lovers. It says, no Bible is perfect, but everyone knows the King James Bible. It is arguably the most popular Bible in history and the basis of many other translations. Most English Bible translations that actively condemn homosexuality have based themselves on the King James Version and have erroneously adapted words to support their own agenda. We want to return to the clean source and start here. So when the language of the King James first the King James Version is antiquated, but we believe it is poetic, traditional, and ceremonial. Christianity is an ancient tradition in the King James and a result in Queen James versions remind us and keep us connected to that tradition. And so uh, that's an interesting introduction to this Bible. And so the first point they make is that King James had many gay lovers, and he was known as Queen James to many of his friends. And so let's dig into that a little bit. Let's talk about a little bit of the history of King James and uh, the, the Bible translation that he had done. And so uh, obviously the King James version is, is one of the most popular versions. Um, there are some people who are King James only who believe that it is directly inspired by God as a version uh, that's different than all other versions. And that's a separate whole theological issue that we don't agree with. But here's a little bit of history of, of the King James Bird. So King James was the king of England. He was King James I, uh, and he's the one who authorized the King James Bible. During this time, uh, King James um, was working through all this political stuff, and she's the one who really brought together the British Empire, the unification of Scotland and England. And it was during this time that most people didn't have a Bible in the English language, and King James had a desire that the Bible would be in everyone's native language. He's actually a real interesting guy. Uh, King James was fluent in Latin, Greek, and French, um, and he also was uh, also spoke some Italian and Spanish. Um, and he even wrote a tract entitled "Counterblasted Tobacco," uh, which was written to help uh, dispel poor tobacco use in England. So he's a really interesting guy. But in 1603, he called together 54 of history's most, um, at that time, uh, intelligent, the, the most you know, uh, educated scholars, and gave them a task of translating the Bible into English because he wanted people to read it in their own language. And so that is a pretty noble task. And so they did that, and um, 
uh, and what he offered them was the greatest gift that he said he could give them was their very own copy of the word in English. And so, so that's really cool that he wanted to do that. So, uh, so that's how the King James version was, um, uh, came about King James commissioned it because he wanted people to read the Bible in their own language. And obviously, you know, in political days, uh, this is still the case today that politicians have enemies and kings and queens have enemies. Um, back in those days, if you had a political enemy, you had them assassinated or it had some big conspiracy against them. And so he had 20 of uh, enemies. One of them was this man named Anthony Weldon. And it wasn't until 1950, so 25 years after the death of King James, that Anthony Weldon saw a chance to kind of tarnish his image. So he wrote a paper calling James a homosexual. And obviously, King James was dead at that point, and so he couldn't defend himself. And that was really widely ignored. No one took it seriously. Everyone knew that this guy was just trying to get revenge on him by by uh, causing these rumors to be spread. But over the now the centuries, people have used that rumor to try to dispel the authenticity of the King James version or try to discredit it. And we, we've seen that several times um, uh, throughout history, people using that against him. And many times it was Christians uh, who were hoping to vilify the King James version and to you know ruin its reputation. But now uh, we see it's being used by a part of the LGBTQ community to say that, that the translation wasn't accurate in regards to um, homosexual issues and that King James himself was an actual homosexual or at least a bisexual and had all these same sex lovers. And so uh, it was actually, it's interesting though, the Roman Catholic history is a different topic that I'm not equipped to cover, but it was actually in 1605 that a Roman Catholic by the name of Guy Fox under the direction of a uh, Catholic priest by the name of Henry Garnett uh, was found in the basement of Parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder, which he was to use to blow up King James in the entire Parliament. And after killing the king, they planned on imprisoning his children, reestablishing England as a state to the royal pope, and all who resisted. Needless to say, the perfect English Bible. Uh, would have been one of the plot victims. And so that's how desperate the Catholic Church was to not have the Bible any translation that the people could actually read. At Calibre Ministries, we have an entire ministry just for parents of LGBTQ kids because we want to be able to shepherd your hearts and encourage you and pray for you and your family as you navigate these situations. So just go to CalibreMinistries.com and fill out the contact form, and I'd love to be in touch with you about how you can be involved in that ministry. Uh, Fox and Garnett and eight other conspirators were actually caught uh, before they blew it up and they were hanged for uh, plotting to kill the king. I love British victory, so does my wife. We've been to England a couple times and we watch all the British things and we now have a sheep herd at home that, of course, are named, but the two ewes are named Mrs. Collins and Mrs. Bennett, uh, which just seems fitting. So over time, people have tried to discredit the King James Version, because they, there's this rumor that King James was gay, which that really doesn't make any difference if he was, that there's no evidence that he actually was. Uh, it, it was clearly just a rumor that I started to try to discredit him uh, by one of his political enemies. So let's get back to uh, what is the Queen James Bible. So, so here it is again. Um, I was actually kind of disappointed when I got it. They actually didn't change anything except for the eight verses that talk about homosexuality. And they said that there might be more changes coming to the in the future. But for now, their purpose was to make it bulletproof from the one shooting bullets at just the gay community. And so uh, they said it still doesn't present equality. And so I thought they'd change all the gendered language. But they actually didn't do that. Instead, they just changed these eight verses that talk about 
um, uh, homosexuality. They also, it's really ironic. There's so much irony in their whole explanation here, which all really I would have needed was the first four pages because the first four pages explains everything they changed. And then the rest of the Bible is just the normal King James version. They said that, uh, there's problems editing verses, um, uh, because they, you're not supposed to edit scripture yet. It's so ironic because that's exactly what they did. Did they said they don't want to remove these verses because removing it doesn't address the interpretive ambiguity. It only brushes it under the rug. And if they remove verses, it renders it an incomplete Bible. And Revelation says not to edit the book. And people often extend that to mean the entire Bible, not just the book of Revelation. And so, yes, we're not supposed to edit the book. Obviously, we translate it to uh, reflect modern language and new languages, but we're not supposed to edit the book. But that's exactly what they did uh, is they edited the book, but they said that they didn't delete any of these verses because we're not supposed to edit it. And so what they did was just reinterpret all of these verses and they make the common fallacy that the word homosexual was not in the Bible until 1946. We've covered that in depth on the podcast, so you guys should really check that out. I don't think we need to beat a dead horse on that because we have several other episodes on that. That even though the word homosexual wasn't in the Bible until 1946, all the verses that talk about homosexuality clearly were condemning homosexuality. The word homosexual was not in the Bible until 1946 because it wasn't a word yet because the language was evolving and there's all kinds of other words and phrases they use to describe homosexuals. But it was the version in 1946 where they actually made the word homosexual to describe what had always been described as homosexuality. It seems like what they did in making the Queen James version here was that they really twisted all of these aspects of homosexuality in the Bible to be talking about like cultic worship and idolatry. And that's what they talk about a lot. You know, I've talked about revisionist theology on how revisionist theology is done by people who believe in the Bible and they believe in God's word. Many of them claim to be Christians, but they change these specific passages and claim that it means something that it doesn't. Uh, you know, it, it, they'll claim that it means pedophilia or rape or incest. Uh, they want it to mean anything other than homosexuality as we practice it today. And so that's what they did with all these passages. And so I want to give some examples of how they edited these passages. They said they want to take away uh, any opportunities for people to use this um, in homophobic interpretations and so uh, they made the edits through these eight verses. The first place where they uh, made some edits were, was in Genesis 19.5. And so what is Genesis 19.5 says? It says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Okay, well, uh, I... I, I'm a little slow on reading my King James. I'm usually not very used to reading the King James version. And it is interesting to point out that um, it's well known that uh, when it says that we may know them, the word know means to know them physically, sexually. And speaking of that, on our merchandise section, on our YouTube channel and our website, we actually have a t-shirt that says, um, I know my wife biblically, because that means that we physically know her in a biblical sense and so you should buy one of those t-shirts to support the ministry there's also some really other uh really funny t-shirts there some of them are kind of snarky and politically incorrect and so please don't uh throw stones at me for that we're just trying to have a little bit of fun and support biblical sexuality and gender with some fun t-shirts so back to genesis 19 5 uh so this is the story of sodom and gomorrah and again they uh, tried to twist this to say that it means uh, something that it doesn't. And so uh, their version of Genesis 19.5 says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may rape and humiliate them. And so they changed the passage to make it about rape and humiliation, not homosexuality. 
Uh, we're actually going to be doing an episode soon on Sodom and Gomorrah. So make sure you watch out for that. I think it'd be really interesting. Um, I'm gonna, it's going to be featuring my friend Joel Kramer, who's a biblical archaeologist uh, who has actually found Sodom and Gomorrah and all the chunks of sulfur that had rained down on fire and some of them were preserved in water uh, for the last you know several thousand years. You know, I'm also going to be talking to a seminary professor, so that's going to be really interesting. So they did what, exactly what I would expect. They changed this verse to mean rape and humiliation instead of homosexuality. And we can look, though, at the original Hebrew that this was written in, and then the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and know that very confidently that uh, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was homosexuality. I have pastors and church leaders regularly reach out to me about speaking at their churches and events. If that's something you would be interested in, feel free to go to calibrateministries.com and fill out the contact form, and I'd love to talk to you about what that would look like. All right, so let's let's get with it. Leviticus. So no one wants to talk about Leviticus, right? But we're going to talk about it. So Leviticus 18, 22 and Leviticus 20, 13 are two of the passages that talk about um, homosexuality in the Old Testament. And one of the things they address here was the word abomination. Um, they said the word abomination is not as bad as we think it is. They say the word abomination actually means uh, to make something ritually unclean or taboo or scandalous. So it's not as, as much of an abomination as we think. And so they're trying to, you know, kind of take off the fire or lessen the fire, uh, so to speak, from what the Bible says about homosexuality. So here's what, uh, how they change these two verses. The original Greek or excuse me, the original text of Leviticus 18, 22 in the King James Version says, Thou shalt not lie with uh, mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. And they change it to say, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. In the temple of Molech, it is an abomination. So they specifically put in the temple of Molech as like this cultic idol worship, as what they're saying was prohibited in Leviticus here. I think that's really interesting because most of the time when people try to change these, the meanings here, I don't see them specifically trying to uh, insert in there something like this, like the Temple of Moloch. So but it's interesting. They still kept the word abomination, but they're just saying the abomination wasn't homosexuality. It was um, this cultic temple worship in the Temple of Moloch. All right. Leviticus 2013. If a man lies with mankind uh, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall pee upon them. Well, I really need to practice reading the King James Version more. So it'd be a good, good experiment. But what they translated it to is this. So the Queen James Version says, if a man also lie with Mankind in the temple of Moloch, as lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And so, uh, if a man also lie with mankind in the temple of Moloch, as he lieth with a woman. So they're they're trying to make this verse reference sex, but they're trying to make it reference sex in a temple worship, uh, idolatrous, cultic worship, as in the temple of Moloch. Um, and compare that to having sex with a woman in a normal sense. Um, and so that's why as life with a woman versus uh, lie with mankind in the temple of Moloch. And so it's really interesting that uh, they cap it as mankind, lie with mankind, uh, but they're just saying that the problem isn't whether or not mankind is man or woman. The problem is whether or not it is in the temple of Moloch. And so that is a really interesting take that I would not have expected. But um, you never know what to expect when you open up a big, fabulous gay Bible. So the next passage now, we are getting to the New Testament. 
And so Romans 1, we can't ignore Romans 1. It's very important. Uh, I talked about Romans 1. Obviously, this is the progression of they exchange the truth about God for lie, and they worship creation instead of the creator. And uh, and they had they exchanged natural relations um, for unnatural ones, which was relationships with people of the same gender. And so here's Romans 126 and Romans 127 in the original King James Version. It says, for this cause, God's, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against their nature. Verse 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burn in their lust uh, one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves uh, that recompense of their error which uh, was met wow uh that is interesting and so um here we go uh they have to really explain away the word unnatural here and so um let's just i'm just going to read this entire paragraph on their explanation of what they did here so they say anti-lgbtq bible interpretations cite women did exchange natural use into that which is against nature to mean that women engage in lesbian sex and that lesbianism is unnatural in historical context with knowledge of ancient pre-bible idolatry we know that women were treated as less than men and even uh, less so in pagan ritual of the time it is much more likely that paul meant to express that women were uh, richly defiling themselves sexually or otherwise after all, these women weren't lying with women, language one would expect from Paul, a devout follower of Leviticus. We can't be exactly sure what Paul meant by the natural use of a woman, but we can pretty sure he wasn't talking about lesbian sex. Romans 128 calls uh, the acts inconvenient, uh, further bolstering our understanding of women's use and her abuse in ceremony. This actually would actually support 128, while women were occupied with unnatural uses of their bodies, which could even meant pagan dancing. We really have no idea The men carried on in typical pagan sexual fashion, like they always had done in pagan worship and being pagan. It was obviously unseemly. Another instance of interpretive ambiguity occurs. We believe because the description of the pagan gay sex is written after the fact, God has abandoned the idolaters. It is easy to therefore say, God gave them up because they were having gay sex. Had the verses read uh, as follows, there would be no confusion. So here's what they uh, changed them to. Their women did change uh, natural use into which that is against their nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of error which was met for this guy give them up their vile affections so there they had just rearranged the word some and so but they take it further to actually edit it more um and so they're trying to make it about temple worship instead of uh actual same-sex relationships so the actual queen james version now says their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also men left of the natural use of the woman uh, burning in ritual lust toward one another with men working that which is pagan and unseemly for this cause god gave the, the idolaters up unto vile affections receiving in themselves that recompense uh of their error which was met all right so um they can now they actually inserted the word you know pagan um ritual uh but there's just no evidence that that is the case you can look at the text women uh exchanging natural relationships with men and having sexual relationships with each other and men exchanging natural relationships with women and having sexual relationships with one another like that's homosexuality that's not pagan cultic worship that has nothing to do with temple worship and it has nothing to do with with women being abused by men 
uh, in the temple, um, as they claim, it's all about men having sex with other men and women having sex with other women. That is the act that is unnatural that Paul is talking about. And so, uh, so this just doesn't hold water. These are people who desperately want to change the text so that um, it means what they want it to mean. All right. Well, now we have to get on to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 9, and then verse 10. So, in the King James Version, uh, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is one of the clobber passages. And although I will say this, I never want to read these two verses without reading the very next verse, verse 11, because it seems like I heard these two verses over and over again growing up. I always share this when I'm sharing my story. And it seems like I never heard verse 11. I don't know if it wasn't read at the same time or if my heart was hardened. And so I just didn't see it. But verse 11 says uh, in the NIV, because that's what I always uh, repeat. And it says, in such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. And so I never want to use those two verses out of context without verse 11, giving people hope. And such were some of you, but you're no longer that. So back to the Queen James Bible. Okay, so um, we we see in the tr- different translations that many times they use two different words or two sort of different phrases. It'll say, uh, e- nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, which is men who are abusing their bodies with other men. Uh, we see that translated into the word homosexual and the more modern um, translations or the phrase homosexual offenders. Uh, sometimes we'll see male prostitutes. Um, uh, NIV uses perverts, um, self-indulgent. Uh, there's there's several different words there, but I think we could be confident that they mean homosexuality between two men. And I've done other podcast episodes on that, so so check that out. A couple of them just pretty recently uh, that we can be very confident in what the two words that are malakoi and arsenikoitai actually mean. But of course, um, they try to twist that and make it into something else. Um, They talk about promiscuity. And so they say that this is being promiscuous. uh, And uh, and so being promiscuous is a health risk uh, to yourself, the others, and disrespectful. So that's why they claim that Paul said abusers of the body with mankind because they're abusing the body by being promiscuous. Um, so they said, we changed uh, Corinthians 6, 9 to reflect this clarified understanding. Um, and they also used 1 Corinthians 6, 10 for, for further context. And so here's the Queen James Version. They say, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor morally weak, nor promiscuous, uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So it's really interesting here that uh, they change the two words, malakoi and arsenikoitai, to uh, morally weak uh, and promiscuous. And so they said that they use the morally weak because it's someone who has weak morals. And yet somehow um, the people who advocate for this, they don't seem to have any moral standard. It's like, well, how do you define promiscuous? Because most of the LGBTQ community who I would see using translations like this and uh, calling themselves LGBTQ and trying to justify, you know, sexual sin, they they don't have standards. They wouldn't say that it's like, well, it's a sin to be promiscuous. It's like, no, just live and let live and live out your homosexuality. And it's it's not a problem. And so they're not advocating for one man and one man for a lifetime and a covenant that you are committed to for a lifetime, like we do in marriage. They're advocating for just this. There isn't anything wrong with this. And so their very own um, uh, interpretation still 
misses the mark on their own standards. And I think that's really ironic. There's there's so many areas of irony with this. Okay. Uh, next is First Timothy 1.10. So this should be an easy one because um, it's the same uh, word, arsenikoitai, as in First Corinthians 10. So what the King James Version says is, uh, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for uh, men stealers, for liars, for perjurers, uh, perjured persons, and if there are any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, gosh, I really should read more of the King James version. It is kind of interesting. So maybe those King James only people have something actually going for them. You know, we won't we won't take it that far. So uh, here's what they translated it into in the queen james version um for whoremongers for them that defile themselves with men stealers for liars for perjured persons and if there be any other that is contrary to sound doctrine and so uh they just said those who defile themselves with mankind so uh they're making it more ambiguous more ambiguous uh it's too late at night to pronounce big words like like ambiguity uh, they made it even more uh, uh, ambiguous, which they said that that's not that they, they're doing the opposite of that. They said that these passages have too much ambiguity. And so they're trying to take away the ambiguity that allows people to condemn homosexuality with it. And yet they uh, made it even more general and broad, um, which is more ambiguous. Uh, and so that's that's. Again, very ironic. We should count the number of times I say ironic in this episode. So next we have Jude 1.7. So the King James Version says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about uh, them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so, uh, obviously, that really depends on um, how we interpret Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'm really excited for that episode. Um, but they said their their explanation for what they change is, given our clarification of the story of Sodom, we chose to highlight the fact that the male mob in Sodom raped angels, which is strange uh, and that is non-human. We changed the verse to the following. So Jude 1-7 in the Queen James Version, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after non-human flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so, again, they changed this to be about angels uh, instead of uh, homosexuality, which, um, you know, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah can be difficult to understand. And that's why I'm excited, excited to dig into it more. But obviously... They are just reading into it um, and editing scripture to make it mean what they wanted to mean. So here's how they ended their little introduction to the Bible. Let me just um, read it. It says, we didn't change anything else to create this edition of the Queen James Bible. The Queen James Bible resolves any homophobic interpretations of the Bible, but the Bible is still filled with inequality and even contradiction that we have not addressed. No Bible is perfect, including this one. We wanted to make sure a book filled with the Word of God that no one could use incorrectly to condemn God's LGBTQ children, and we succeeded. Uh, the discussion of homosexuality in the Bible is great and far-reaching, and we encourage all to study it more. So I think that uh, I think that we can maybe be slightly encouraged that these people are wanting to study the Bible. And, you know, I guess if there's one bright point of it, it is that. And so we should be praying for them. We should be praying that as they study God's word, that they would have conviction that God would speak to them and that, uh, you know, they would come to their knees in repentance. And we should use the Bible as a weapon to fight for them. I've said this over and over again, that my life started to change when uh, people quit using the Bible as a weapon to fight against me. And they started using the weapon as a Bible to fight for me, to come along beside me and fight my spiritual battles with me. And so I think that should be the prayer for all of us. This We can use God's word. Um, it is fabulous. 
in its own way. It is remarkable. It is the inerrant word of God. It is how he speaks to us. And it is remarkable. And let's use it to come alongside people and to fight for them. Let's pray scripture over them. Let's pray scripture in their their lives. And let's use it as a tool like it is intended for us. And let's trust in every word that it is true and accurate and that God preserved his word for us. And even though sometimes there are translation issues, we can still trust what it says because thankfully we have the original Greek and Hebrew, which we can understand more and more all the time, which is really, really remarkable. So that is the Queen James Bible. I wouldn't recommend spending $28 on it on Amazon. I already told you everything you need to know about it. And so I really appreciate you guys joining us. I I, I kind of joked around a lot in this episode but uh, which I don't normally do a lot, but it is a serious issue that people around us are struggling and people have had the Bible used against them to just clobber them. And so let's have compassion and grace. Uh, make sure you check out calibrateministries.com for more resources, more podcast episodes, and uh, find out how you can support the ministry. We rely on donors uh, to, uh, to fund the ministry and what we do. And so we love your support. You can go to calibrateministries.com and make a donation or sign up for our monthly support team. We'd love for you to sign up for our email list so you know what's going on with the ministry because we do so much more than just a podcast. Make sure you sign up for that at the website. And just please let me know how I can pray for you or how I can serve you in any way. All right. Thank you so much.